It's been nearly two years since the UFC last took a pay-per-view to Toronto, but they are back once again this weekend. And let me tell you what, friends, it looks to be a damn fun night. Hello and welcome. My name is Sean Oshadi, and this is the UFC 231 preview show. I am joined today by our resident son of the North, my good friend, Alexander K. Lee, and we are standing here outside of the Scotiabank Arena in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, ready to break down all of the action ahead of Saturday night. And it is very cold, Alex. I am from the desert. I am a desert boy. I, have, I forgot what it felt like to be cold. I can see my breath. It's uh, kind of cool, though. Uh, I like it. It is, it, is, it is a balmy, I'll put it in American, uh, like 25 degrees Fahrenheit, like negative 3, negative 4 Celsius. It's just beautiful outside. Look at, look at how happy everyone is. Look how bright and sunny it is. It's gorgeous. It is quite beautiful. Thank you for welcoming me yeah, to your, your well. fair city. Uh, so, hey, let us start with this main event. And what a main event this is. Max Holloway versus Brian Ortega for the UFC featherweight title. The fight we never got at UFC 226. Uh, I, have, I have said long ago, earlier this year, after Brian Ortega did hit knocked out Frankie Edgar in spectacular fashion that this is one of the fights I was most looking forward to in 2018. I still stand by that. I, I cannot wait for this fight. So let's start here because there were a lot of questions and concerns leading into this week about Max Holloway. What state would he be in? How would his health be? Has he really recovered from the issues that took him out of that fight back in July? And they were very scary issues. So I want to ask you, Alex, you've been here on the ground with me in Toronto. You have spoken to Max this week. You have watched him. I want to get your impressions. What, what have you seen from Max? Does he feel like the Max Holloway of old? Well, Sean, as you mentioned, you know, we did get the chance to talk with Max a lot this week. And I personally did not notice anything particularly off with the champion. I know a lot of people are looking for signs, little cracks in his demeanor, maybe cracks in his dialogue, trying to pick apart, ooh, you know, are there any signs of the, the, the mystery kind of symptoms that knocked him out of the first Ortega meeting? I, I don't think so. I, I think he looks. He, he answered questions as he usually does with that same kind of mixture of you know casual bravado. He, he looked fine. He's saying all the right things. He was very <laughs> he was very fired up at official weigh-ins. Yeah, yeah, very fired up. Really wanted to make a statement. You know, definitely for the media gather. Definitely for all the fans out there who are wondering, man, can this guy safely make 145 anymore? I, I can say again, just from what we saw. Look comfortable, look good, and definitely look like he, he's, he's ready to fight. So not too worried about that at all. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny in a way because I feel like this is one of those situations where he has been gone for so long that we have almost forgotten how good this guy really is. I mean, this is someone who has won 12 straight fights, back-to-back -back knockouts over a man I consider to be the greatest featherweight of all time, Jose Aldo, and those were devastating knockouts. Uh, and he just turned 27 years old this week, actually, in Toronto. So he is really hitting what should be his fighting prime. But I don't know that he has ever really had to deal with a year from hell like 2018. He is basically prepared for four different fights this year. This is his fourth fight that he's preparing for. He has not gotten to fight once yet. Uh, injuries took him out at the beginning of the year. Then he had the weight issue against Khabib. That was on short notice, obviously. And then, of course, the, the scary issues that took him out at UFC 226, of which we still don't really know what it was. So I want to ask you, I mean, just your impression of Max, maybe seeing him this week, but just in general as well. He's dealing with a lot coming into this fight. I mean, ring rust is one thing, because having not fought all year, but also just the, the, what the, the baggage that has come with this fight at this point of having all those issues. Do you feel like he is the type of, of fighter, the type of person that that's going to affect him on Saturday? I, I can't imagine how it won't. Like I said, I think he looks great, but there's so much underneath the surface that we don't see, that we don't know about. You know, we don't know the, how, how, tough, how tough it actually was to make the weight. Like I said, it looked, the end product looked okay, could have been more grueling than we thought. And you know, it's funny you mentioned this year. I don't know if any champion has suffered through such a like calamitous year as Max Holloway has this year. He was so hot coming off that second Aldo win. It looked he was like, fighter of the year. It looked like 2018 was, it looked he could have gone back to back, you know? And then the Edgar fight falls through because of an injury to him, uh, to, to Holloway. And uh, the, the, the stepping in for Habib was so exciting for the, the few days that it lasted before they realized, okay, well maybe he just can't do it. And, and the commission made the decision to pull him out. And then yes, the second, uh, the first Ortega booking and now, now he has to prepare to fight again. It'll be really great for him. I, I think he can look back on things positively, obviously with a win, you know, his uh, getting a second title defense against maybe the most dangerous challenger, number one contender in any weight class right now. But yeah, I, I don't know if anyone has faced a year like this, and I don't know if anyone could go into fight night not affected by all the stuff he's had to deal with this year. So it'd be very interesting to see just once he walks out what he looks like then. Well, sure, and you mentioned that challenger. Let us talk about this challenger because Brian Ortega is really everything you could ask for in a compelling title challenger. 
Uh, this man is 14-0, undefeated, the king of the comeback, the master of the late round submission. He is the only man to ever knock out Frank Yeager, which to me still feels like a dream. I am still amazed that he did that. And now he is coming into this fight. He's 28 years old, just like Max. He's basically hitting his fighting prime. Uh, it feels as though this is going to be not the, not the only time that these two guys fight. They are the two best in this division. It, it really feels that's definitive, and they are both so young. They will probably meet again, and they have said as much this week. For you, does this feel like the most difficult challenge for Max in this featherweight division, considering all of this, the skill set and, and basically an aura almost that Brian Ortega brings into this fight? Yeah, you know, I think he's definitely the biggest challenge. And it's even from a personality standpoint, you know, I thought Max had that kind of cool island boy thing uh, covered, you know. Beach, feel like, let me look at him as a beach boy. Then Brian Ortega comes along, <laughs> he surfs, he's a chill California bro, you know. So personality-wise, he's even set to kind of replace Max, you know, Max Holloway in that way. And fighting-wise, I mean, that goes without saying. Like I said, amazingly powerful finisher, can finish late finished early like, as against Frankie Edgar as we all saw incredible first round KO and Max you know he gets hit I mean he gets he hit does. in his fights that's something we like about Max so much is that he's, he, he stands in there he gets hit he smiles he's, he keeps moving he loves to hit back let's get involved in brawls and but if you do that with Ortega man I don't know he's he's dropped some people with, he's known as a jiu-jitsu guy he's done some serious damage flying knee uppercut to, to Edgar Took him off his feet. Took him off his feet. So, he, yeah, I, I don't think there could be a better challenger. And, look, there's a reason that a lot of people are saying and knew already ahead of fight night. Well, hey, I want to ask you one last question about Brian Ortega. Because when you, yes, he knocked out Frank Yeager, but the conversation with him always begins and ends and must loop around to those jiu-jitsu skills. He is an utterly sublime grappler. I mean, his transitions, uh, the, his lockdown, just his chokes in general. I mean, we all remember his guillotine on on Cub Swanson readjusting it in midair. He is transcendent in that regard, it really feels as though. Uh, on Max Holloway's side, though, on the other side, he is not someone to suffer those things lightly. He has, only suffered, he has only suffered one submission loss in his entire career, and you have to go all the way back to his UFC debut against Dustin Poirier. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, is that the main biggest factor for you heading into this fight? Is that the biggest question that needs to be answered? Is Max Holloway's defensive grappling versus Brian Ortega's offensive jiu-jitsu? And also, just do you think Max has what it takes to survive? on the ground in a way that nobody else has. You know, what's funny is I almost don't look at it as a defining factor. I almost look at it more of it as an X factor. I, I, I don't know, you know, we don't know Brian Ortega's and his team's game plan. Maybe it is to say, oh, we're going to stand and bang, as a lot of fighters do. And then on fight night, get in there, you know, go for a takedown or, or wrap Max up, go for a trip, take it down to the mat as soon as possible. I think he is going to want to test out his striking, Ortega. And, you know, if it doesn't go his way, at least like you said, we know he has the option of going to the ground. Holloway is definitely no slouch. I, I would be stunned. Well, no. I would say against Ortega, he's probably the one guy who I wouldn't be stunned to see oh. him get submitted because Ortega is so strong. His jiu-jitsu is, is, is incredible. And it's, it's just that finishing instinct, you know, the finishing instinct that not everybody has. So, some guys aren't willing to sacrifice position or, or, or take a risk, you know, on the ground, especially against a dangerous guy like Holloway who, you know, you might get one takedown and that's it. Uh, and then you might not get on top again. So, but I don't think Ortega thinks that way. I think Ortega, I think Ortega thinks one, he can probably get takedowns when he wants, and two, if, if he thinks there's a chance that he could become the second guy to submit Max Holloway, oh, he's gonna go for it. So if I pick up what you're putting down, it feels as though you're picking Ann New. It feels as though you're picking Brian Ortega. Is that the pick? Yeah. You know, all, all respect to Max Holloway again. Uh, a, a great. I'm, I'm so glad that, that he made weight today, and that he, you know he's gonna. We're gonna see him hopefully at, at his at his best on fight night. But. I'm of the I'm of the and new camp. No disrespect to the champion. I think I think Brian Ortega, he's on that run. You know, it's funny. We never know how great someone is. Maybe until they actually they actually lose. But I don't think Saturday is the day he loses. I think Saturday is the day Ortega's run continues, and uh, maybe the beginning of this trilogy that him and him and Max keep talking about. You know, and I think I agree with you. Uh, I think the ring rust is going to be a. It, Max has never gone this long without fighting. Ultimately, I, I, Brian Ortega has everything, every skill set that you could ask for in a challenger. I am picking him as well. And let us move on to this co main event because what a co main event it is. I mean, Valentina Shevchenko versus uh, Ioana Janjacek for the vacant women's uh, flyweight title. This is, and you know, I, I want to start this conversation by saying I know we in the media. Uh, we are very prone to hyperbole. We proclaim things to be the greatest ever often. This is the greatest, that's the greatest ever. But 
it really does feel to me that this is one of the most skillful women's MMA fights that we have ever seen, considering all of the things that these two women have accomplished, the accolades and just the skill sets they're bringing in and really what brought them to this point. It feels to me that this is either one of, if not the greatest women's fights that we have seen. And I just want to get your take first. Do you agree with that? Uh, I, I am in agreement with that. I think we've had some great matchups. You know, I don't, I don't want to look down on stuff like, like uh, Holly Holm and Chris Cyborg, which, sure. I, which kind of turned out to be a dud, but on paper, super strong matchup, not just based on their MMA skills, things they'd achieved in other striking disciplines. You can go back to some of Ronda Rousey's fights. I know people question her, her, her level of competition in retrospect, which I don't think is always fair, but I think her fight with Lech Michita Tate was, was, was good. You know, they had, they had two, two, two good fights. But, you know, the sport is always evolving. Yeah. And I think, just as we said that the featherweight main event might be the most compelling 145-pound matchup we've ever seen, this might be the I most... I don't know about ever seen. McGregor Aldo was pretty uh, great. Is, I mean, but competitive, I don't know, competitively, again, well, it's hard to look back that fight ended so quickly. But as far as Shevchenko and, and Yachechik, for sure, this, this, I think this is the, the highest level of, of women's MMA that you'll, that you'll see. I don't want to say ever, you know, I, I, like I said, sports always evolving. There's great talents out there. Great talents at 125. You sure. know, great, we could see great, better fights at 125 sometime in the future, whether it's Shevchenko or Yachechik who ends up carrying this division, you know, after Saturday. But yeah, it, it, if, I think it'll live up to the hype. I think it's, it's, it's as it's built, it's completely accurate. Yachechik and Shevchenko, highest, 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 highest of, of women's MMA. Well, you know, it's no secret that there's a lot of history here between these two women. They have fought three times back in the day in their Muay Thai days, and Valentina Shevchenko won all three of those fights. And I feel like that has really led to a really interesting dynamic here in Fight Week in Toronto, because Joanna Janjacek is someone who very often always wants to play the mental game. She's very good at uh, psyching out her opponents, talking trash, that sort of thing. And I don't know that you can really do that when you're down 0-3 in the series. And I feel like that's sort of what we've seen this week during Fight Week. Valentina Shevchenko has even said so, that she know that Joanna knows that that wouldn't make sense to do so. So I want to ask you, I mean, seeing these two women interact with each other and also just field questions from us, do you feel like anybody has the mental edge in this? Do you feel like that history, even though it was a long time ago, plays any part in this matchup? You know, usually I always want to give Joanna the mental edge, and, and I kind of I kind of still do. I was a little surprised that she she didn't have a little more bravado because even after losing to Rose, she it, it, you know before their rematch, she was almost acting like their first fight was a fluke or like the loss didn't even happen. So, to this day, she's still saying she's the best the best fighter of 115. So. I don't know. I don't know, Sean. I, I do think it, I, I want to give the mental edge to Joanna just a little bit. She just has that unwavering confidence. That's surprising confidence. to me. Well, she just has that unwavering confidence. Not to take anything away from Shevchenko, who's, who's always strong, but I, I like the attitude that, that Joanna's coming in with. You know, she, she's acknowledging the, the, that kickboxing past, their last encounter happened a, a, a decade ago, so there's no reason to harp on it. She's acknowledged it existed, and she can point to you know, her massive success that she's had in MMA as reasons to be confident, uh, despite the two losses uh, in her last three fights. You know, she's coming off a win against Tisha Torres. She looked great. I, I don't want to say, it sounds you know, so cliche to say the old Joanna's back. I think the old Joanna's back. Well, let me ask you about Joanna really quickly because, yes, yeah, she was a long town queen at 115 pounds, but it really became obvious within the past couple years that her time in that division was numbered. Those weight cuts started getting progressively harder for her, and really, in that first Rose Nama Yunus fight, she has attributed a very bad weight cut to, to part of the reason she lost. Now she finally does move up to 100, 225 pounds. She has those extra 10 pounds. Uh, and really, it's, it, you could see a different Yuana this week. It felt as though she wasn't having to worry so much about the weight cut and was enjoying the process more. So I'm just curious for your perspective. What have you seen from Yuana so far at 125? And do, you, and do you feel like you will see a different Yuana here on Saturday? I would go as far as to say that Yuana looks Disney happy. I mean, I don't, I don't know if anyone's <laughs> seen that commercial that she's done, the Polish Disney commercial she's Good done. Good callback, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, seek that out. It was recent. You know, seek that out if you haven't seen it. She looks... The ha like the happiest person in the world, which I guess is what you're supposed to do when you're in a Disney commercial. And, and she, she, honestly, there were moments like that during this week, certainly during her workout. She just had a smile on her face the whole time. She, she's talked about, oh, 125 is so much easier. She's, a, she, you know, just not worrying about the weight cut. Every fighter says this, and we always wonder, why don't more fighters move up to a more natural size? Even she's saying she's planning to drop back down, which is, I, I don't know how you feel about that. Let's shot, not entertain that. It just seems, it just seems silly. You know, if she wins, let's hope it's a, it's the start of a long, prosperous, healthy reign at 125 pounds for Yolanda. She looks happy. Well, let's talk quickly about Valentina Shevchenko because it's interesting with her. I feel like for a long time she was looked at as sort of this uncrowned queen of 125. Even when the division didn't exist, the narrative around yeah. her sort of was, right. 
was centered around the idea that if it came to be, she would be the one to really take those reins and ru rule that throne moving forward. Even back when she was supposed to fight a couple months ago against Nico, it was a given in a lot of people's eyes that she was going to win that title. So now the moment is finally here, the division's here, her title shot is here. I want to ask you, I mean, what do you think her ceiling is at 125? Because to me, it feels as though the division is obviously still very fresh. I don't know that she's going to find a more difficult matchup other than Yuana. So if she beats Yuana on Saturday, where's her ceiling? Do you think she could become a Tyron Woodley, uh, Daniel Cormier, even a Demetrius Johnson type of champion who can rule over this belt for several defenses in a couple years? Yeah, it's funny, you know, for as often as Joanna talks about her her legacy and 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 her stand, you know, where she stands among the greatest female fighters of all time. I don't know if I've seen Shevchenko mention it once. You know, you would think that she would maybe take that moment to say, well, if she thinks she's the best if she beats me, then uh, you know, doesn't it doesn't it stand to to reason that if I win on Saturday, I'm that much closer to being the best? Uh, her ceiling is you know, it's it's unquestionably high. Again, you're only as good as, as the people you beat. You're only as good as, as the streak that you can go on. As you mentioned, so many people thought of her as the best at 125 already. Now she at least gets the chance to finally make it official, make it formal, and in some ways also also validate this this division, this 125 division, which was, I feel, a great addition to the UFC that just was introduced in the most bizarre and and uh, I would say uncreative way. Uh, with all due respect to the Ultimate Fighter and the, the work that Bill put in that show and uh, and Nico Montano, you know, it, it feels like it begins on Saturday, not not just the next step of Valentina Shevchenko's legacy, but how we look at the 125 pound division going forward. Well, I gotta get, I gotta get a pick from you. It's a oh, tough yeah. matchup, it's a tough matchup, but who takes it, how, why? I have to see it going to a decision. It, 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 it's difficult for me to, to see either woman be able to finish the other. They're both so smart and so, tec so technical and difficult to finish, frankly. So I, I'm leaning towards Shevchenko. I, I'm just kind of leaning towards Shevchenko she won all their striking battles in the past. They were kickboxing affairs, not MMA affairs, but she did win them all. This stands to be primarily a, a striking battle. And if it's not, we've certainly seen more from Shevchenko on the ground than we have of Joanna. Joanna's takedown grappling defense, top shelf, outstanding. But I do think Shevchenko's bigger, striking-wise, at, at worst, even, and then on the ground, superior. So I, just with going by like basic arithmetic, I, I think we have Shevchenko uh, capturing that vacant title on Saturday. You know what, I don't want to agree with you on both championship fights, but I feel like I have to. I think I see Valentina Shevchenko winning this title and probably holding this title for a little bit. Uh, now let's quickly hit a couple of the big fights on the main card. Uh, light heavyweight battle between Tiago Santos and Jimmy Manoa. This one could end quickly. Uh, Jimmy Manoa is coming into this fight off a two-fight losing streak. He is 38 years old. It feels as though this really is a make-or-break fight for him in terms of his title contention. On the other, other side of things, Thiago Santos has come in and having looked sensational his 205-pound debut against Eric Anders, who admittedly is a middleweight. But, uh, he, you know, Thiago Santos is someone who just beat Anthony Smith not too long ago, and Anthony Smith has had this run now in this new division where it feels as though there's a lot of opportunity at light heavyweight. So I want to just ask you, generally, how do you see this fight? And if Tiago Santos is able to defeat a name like Jimmy Manoa on Saturday, do you feel like he could have the similar type of Anthony Smith-esque run in 2019 where maybe we're talking about him in this conversation uh, this time next year? Yeah, no, it's certainly possible. He's, he's a different fighter than Anthony Smith. But I know what you mean as far as just, just kind of getting refreshed, people getting a new look at, at Tiago Santos. He's fought a lot. He's fought a lot in the UFC. He started as a welterweight. He started as a welterweight, which anyone has seen the man is completely insane. And like I said, he's, so he's fought a lot. So there's a little bit of a worry that at 185 he was growing stale. I know that sounds strange for a guy whose fights are always so exciting and has produced so many highlights. But you kind of get stuck in that rut of, oh, he's an exciting fighter. He, he, you know, he gets highlight real knockouts. Is he a contender? It just seemed like no one would ever want to talk about it in that way because it's, you know, win two, win three, and then, you know, lose one, lose one here and there. It just kept snapping his streaks. Changing a division is a very, very easy, I don't say easy, it's difficult, but it's, it's a good way to, to make people look at you in a new light. Yeah. Uh, the win over Anders was solid. A win over Manoa, a top 10 guy. I know yes. he's, he's coming off a couple of losses, but he is in the top 10. So to get that fight. And he's a big light heavyweight. Yeah, to get that fight back, because they were supposed to fight before. So to get, to get that fight back on track, it's a huge opportunity for Santos. I, I, I hesitate to say a win necessarily puts someone on the same path as Anthony Smith, but a year ago, I wouldn't have said that Anthony Smith's wins would have put Anthony Smith on his path. So, who's to say? Well, hey, I need a pick from you. I feel like oh. this one could end quickly. Yeah. What, how, does it, how does this fight look? Who wins and how? You know, I'm actually, I'm going to go with the poster boy. I, I, I think 
he's going to be at a bit of a speed deficit. You know, Tiago Santos, smaller man coming up. Yeah, sure, he'll he'll probably be a little quicker to the punch. But I, I've always liked Mano with striking. I think he's he's technical. You know, he's technical. I think he's patient. I, I'm also going to go with the uh, you know the wounded animal theory. He's kind of got his back to the wall, and I don't see this as his as his last hurrah. I see this as as actually maybe the start of his, his last his last kind of run of, of, of good big fights. So I think he's going to uh, tell this, you know, 185-er, you know, hold your horses. Hold your horses in contending at light heavyweight. You know, I know it's a, it's a thin division, but, you know, Jimmy Manoa, he's, he's got knockout power. I think, he, I think he might knock Maheta out. Well, you almost talked me into it there, but I'm going to go Tiago Santos. Just, we got to do, we got to make different sure. picks at some point. So I'm going to pick Tiago Santos. I think he takes it. And next fight on that pay-per-view card, and this is another fun one. Man, I love this card. Alex Oliveira versus Gunnar Nelson in a welterweight showdown between contenders. Uh, this is an interesting one because, let's start here, because this welterweight division, we talk about it often about how deep it is and how talent rich it is. It is so difficult for guys to really poke their heads above the sand to be noticed uh, in such a, a deep division. Alex Cowboy Oliveira is a perfect example. He is quietly become this very sneaky good contender here in this division. He has only lost one of his last seven. He has beaten a couple really good names over the course of that, of that run. Carlos Condit, Tim Means. On the other side of things, Gunnar Nelson coming in here off a very long layoff. He was injured earlier in the year. Uh, he has not fought once in 2018. I feel as though when he came into the UFC, people had a lot of high expectations for him. He was blowing the doors off people early. But then he really has struggled to put together a nice run over the last couple uh, of years. So I want to, you know, it's a big fight for both men. It's an important fight for both men. What's the biggest factor for you? Well, for the first thing, as long as, as uh, you know, a Gunnar Nelson doesn't have someone jab their whole hand into his eye, I like his chances of being a little more competitive. <laughs> That's fair. This time That's around, I, I, you know, I, I'm sorry. It has to be said. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not campaigning for, for, you know, Gunnar Nelson in any big way, but... That, that was a tough loss because outside of that, his losses have kind of come to grinding wrestlers. So, you know, in that sense, it, you kind of like his chances against Oliveira. Oliveira is a good grappler. I wouldn't call him a grinding wrestler. He's a high-octane guy. He's going to come at Nelson. You know, he's going to really challenge that karate style. That, that karate style of Nelson's going to have to be on point. And, and after 500-plus uh, days off, very long layoff for, for Gunnar Nelson, who's only fought three times in the last three years, I, 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 almost like some of the doubts we have about Max Holloway, Mentally, how prepared can you be to keep getting in there, and especially against a guy who, who is such a, a, a finishing force in Alex Cowboy Oliveira? He just looks for he's looking for the finish the whole time. There's no feeling out process with this man. So, Gunnar is, is really going to be tested right away. Uh, a very tough matchup for him. But I actually kind of I kind of like that they put him together. Who are you taking? I, I think I have to go with Cowboy. Like, I, I'm not I'm not counting out Gunnar Nelson by any means, but I'm, I'm I feel very strongly about the Cowboy pick. I think he's going to be a little bit sharper on the feet. I think I know Gunnar Nelson on paper is the stronger grappler, but that that Oliveira, he gets submissions. You know, I mean, he hurts people, he gets submissions, he wears you down. I don't know if he can finish Gunnar Nelson. This might be this might be the first win for Oliveira in a while that he can't put the guy away. But I do like Cowboy. Well, hey, I I, th I respect that opinion. I think Cowboy is a very difficult fighter to come back to for your comeback fight after such a long layoff, but I am picking Gunnar Nelson in this fight. Uh, and really quickly before we go, this may not be the most star-studded card outside of the top two fights, but there are a lot of little nuggets there to like, a lot of little uh, fights that could be consequential moving forward. So I want to ask you about that. What are one or two fights under the radar on this card that you were looking at? I mean, look, there's at least one that's on the preliminary portion of the card, the uh, Fox Sports 1 preliminary portion. Uh, Caitlin Chukagian and Jessica I. Number big, one, yeah, big fight, number one contender fight. A lot of people were kind of surprised that it didn't find its way onto the main card, uh, and understandably so because it's not just a contenders fight. Uh, Chukagin and, and just guy, they're going to stand up. They're going to, you know, people like always say they want to stand up fight. Chukagin and, and I, they're going to stand up and fight. You know, I is a good grappler, but definitely this one's going to start in the feet. It's going to stay there for a while, and the winner is really, really going to make a statement about challenging, you know, Shuchenko or Yachechik, whoever walks out tonight. So. Definitely keep your eye out for that one if, you, if you're planning to catch the prelims. Well, hey, that about wraps it up here for us. This has been the UFC 231 preview show. Thank you so much for watching, not only today, but all throughout the week as we have brought you continuing coverage from here in Toronto. Uh, it's going to be a fun night tomorrow on Saturday. My name is Sean Oshadi for Alexander K. Lee. Keep it locked to MMA fighting all weekend as we give you pre-fight coverage, post-fight, everything you have come to expect from this team. In the meantime, for Casey, Esther, me, Alex, Thank you so much for watch for thank you so much for watching again. Enjoy the fights. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. We will see you tomorrow.